You know, sometimes I just wish a magical fairy would come along and give me an idea for something to do. Hey, it's a sick. I was wondering, do you want to do some lines for my latest video? I'm answering five questions from Nathan Thompson. Because it was either that or this rubbish five questions video from Mark Sargent, but... You know, no one wants to scrape the bottom of that barrel. Yeah, sure, I'll help you out, but only because I'm so handsome, etc, etc. And no, of course, no one would want to do that. <laughs> but just out of curiosity, can I have the video? For science. It's all right, Sick. I know you're going to make a video with it. It's okay if anyone could get some value out of that garbage. It's you. Ah, oh, cheers, man. And since you are such a big brainer science guy, I expect you to chime in from time to time. Wait, you're going to steal my video idea and then you expect me to do extra work too? Thanks, buddy! Some months ago, a German television team contacted me because they had heard about my science challenge and had found a physicist at Georgetown University I could debate. So if you don't know about Marky Boy here, well, he am a flat earther. So when he says he has scientific questions, what he actually means is he has questions he thinks are scientific, but generally show his complete lack of understanding of the topic. They also wanted to make it as easy on the scientist as possible, so their idea was simple. Did they? I find that a little hard to believe. Maybe that's what they told you in order to get you to do what they wanted in the fashion that they wanted it. I mean, if I wanted to get an idiot to make a fool of himself, I would definitely stroke his ego a bit first. And maybe some other things. No, don't be crude. I meant his papa doggo if he has one, because that's like the law. They would record me on video, reading five quick science-based questions, and then send that recording over to Georgetown, and he would respond in kind. Having watched a little bit ahead first, I have a really strong feeling that this did not happen. That this unnamed scientist either simply doesn't exist or was just plain completely unaware of their involvement in this farce. And the only person taking this seriously was, well, you. This is what I read on camera. One, long distance photography. The mainstream science formula for the curvature of the Earth is 8 inches per mile squared. Oh great, you already f***ed it up. Gonna jump right into something that's just wrong. That is not the mainstream science measurement for the curve of the Earth, and never has been. Now, I'm not a great mathematizer or nothing, we don't like that stuff around here, but I can look up simple things like what 8 inches per mile squared is for, and it turns out it doesn't measure a sphery boy, but instead a parabola. This is what it looks like when applied to the Earth. Now you'll notice that it stays kind of close for a, just a little while and then shoots off into non-existent space. Because you see, the 8 inches per blah 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 can accurately enough measure the dip over short distances. But as soon as you start making any longer measurements, it's basically useless. An easy comparison would be the falling rate of 32 feet per second per second. So 8 inches per mile per mile. 2 miles is 2 times 2 equals 4 times 8 inches or 32. 3 miles is 3 times 3 equals 9 times 8 or 72. And so on. And so on and so wrong. That is to say, it gets more wrong the further you measure. Slowly but surely until it becomes completely worthless as a way of measuring the shape of the Earth even inaccurately. And, 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 it also is based on your head being buried in the ground. So if you were to use it, you really wouldn't be able to see anything at all. At 50 miles, the curvature is 50 times 50 times 8, coming in at over 1,600 feet of curvature. And yet, with HD cameras, we can pull boats back into frame that are well beyond visual range. Even without this formula just being wrong, you are also not accounting for the height of the camera user. You aren't accounting for the height of the boat. You don't see a problem with that because, well, it plays into your fantasy. Come back with an accurate formula and the other numbers that are absolutely required to figure out what the range actually is. And then we could show you why you're wrong. Or more likely, you'll figure that out for yourself and not show up out of embarrassment. Or at least I'd hope. Not only does the new technology clearly show that it's not a mirage, but the same objects can be viewed in infrared 
and could be targeted ship to ship by beam radar. Can science explain this? Yes, actually. Well, maths can. As you see, the formula for measuring the Earth's curvature without flying off into space is... Uh, we don't want those actual maths around these parts. Save it for your own channel. Anyway, the real question is, can science explain why he is using the wrong tools for the job and leaving out important numbers? Probably something about falling out of his high chair as a baby and immediately sticking his fingers into the nearest electrical socket. That would be my guess. Yeah, sounds about right. They had no answer. And see, that's how I know that this whole thing is either a trick on you or just outright fabrication on your part. If I, a humble dumbass, have some fairly rudimentary, probably far from perfect answers for you, but still answers, then I am sure that a big brain sciencer from a university would have far more detailed answers for you. That all this is all true and your video simply rendered them completely brain dead after about 70 seconds. Which come to think of it, seems pretty likely. Thank god I'm an idiot and thus cannot be injured by your stupidity attack. Number two. Haha, <laughs> poop joke. Sorry, just wanted to get some jokes in at the flurf level so they could find at least some amusement out of this video too. Although, it's still pretty funny. <laughs> poop. Vacuum versus gravity. The force of a vacuum is measured in units of tor, T-O-R-R. -R. Even a low level vacuum can overcome gravity here on the surface. Um, okay. Not sure where you're going with this, but it could be interesting. Go ahead. In building molecule-free chambers for the manufacturing of electronics, a series of massive pumps are needed to create a 99% vacuum. There's a joke in there somewhere about the 99% vacuum in a flat earther's head, but I'm above making that kind of crass and just plain mean joke. Poop jokes on the other hand. <laughs> Poop on your other hand. That's negative nine tor. And for the remaining 1%, horsepower isn't enough. It can only be achieved by a chemical leaching process. That being said, how is the negative 10 tor vacuum force of space not ripping off the atmosphere of this world? Oh, oh no, you, you don't know how a vacuum works, do you? Oh dear, you poor deluded honky. Even I know this one. It's really rather simple. Vacuums don't suck. I know that's what you think because of a vacuum cleaner, but that's not how it works. No, an actual vacuum is the absence of stuff, and stuff likes to be where there is no stuff, especially when you have bugger tons of air pressure around said vacuum. Basically, the walls of a vacuum chamber aren't trying to keep all the vacuum from getting out, it's trying to stop all the air around it from getting in. What is gravity? Apart from the fact that that's an interesting question, what is going on with this guy. I guess it's just one of those mysteries that we will never ever solve. Like, who the hell thought it was a good idea to put him on a stage? Cruel, evil people. That's who. Uh, and remember that there are gases that already defy it. Like helium, hydrogen, and fluorocarbons. Wait, you think that lighter than air gases defy gravity? Ow! My brain, his stupid is starting to affect me. One moment, please. Alright, I beat the stupid out of me, it's okay. If you think that helium defies gravity, I want to ask you why we don't just tie a bunch of balloons to a compartment and just send it into space up style. Is it because it wouldn't breach our atmosphere because, and I know this will be a big shock to you, the big braining flurfy boys out there, it's still being affected by gravity and is merely floating to the top of the atmosphere, or at least reasonably high in it. Christ, this man is dumb. Isn't it more logical to suggest the atmosphere is being contained in an enclosed pressurized system? Absolutely not. And I am offended by your use of the word logical. That's our word, you piece of shit. They had no answer. If you said something that ridiculous to me with a straight face, I'm not sure I would have an answer for you either. I would probably just walk off and throw myself into the nearest river, hoping it would whisk me away from the silly question man as soon as possible. Number three, eclipse shadow. Mainstream science tells us the moon is over 2,000 miles wide, and yet during the 2017 American eclipse, no offense, 
the moon's shadow was only 70 miles wide, a reduction of over 97%. Because you don't know how light works. Sun big, really big, moon small, relatively. We see light go round moon. How is this man taken seriously by the flat earthers? Sorry, sorry, just answered my own question. This is what the equivalent of having a six foot man walking in front of a wall where his shadow is smaller than an action figure at only two inches. Where do we see this in our everyday lives? What is misunderstanding is that as a shadow gets larger, as he would probably call it, it's actually getting blurrier at the edges. But the centre of the shadow, the umbra or the dark bit as Mark might call it, gets much smaller as the penumbra or the outer edge gets much lighter and blurrier. This video here by Robert Laufler demonstrates the effect quite nicely. The same thing happens with the moon on a much larger scale, making the penumbra all but invisible. We've seen a shadow's actual size and some much larger. Where can we see small shadows? So, you want to know where we can see a thing that requires a light source larger than a man and as bright as the sun on the Earth? Well, as it turns out, it's shining right out of my arm! The Flat Earth community says that the moon is less than 50 miles wide, much closer and the same size as the sun. Well, the Flat Earth community thinks that the Earth is flat, so probably not the best source for information. Although, hold on, that actually sounds like a consensus. And my experience with the Flat Earth community is you mother flippers don't agree on anything, bar the Earth's shape, and even then, there are different versions. Unfortunately, having a consensus is what people who know what they are talking about have. And it's funny to me that you would pretend that that is the case for you guys when it so totally isn't. Isn't this explanation also possible? No. They had no answer. Yeah, they did. It was no, but to say no, they just sighed, turned off your video, and just started to stare at the ceiling, wondering where the human race went wrong, and whether they should have taken that job at the bioweapons research lab. They could just wipe the slate clean. Maybe there's still time. Number four, moon temperature. Science has yet to address this relatively new discovery that the moon generates a cold light. New discovery of the moon giving off cold light. I have a funny feeling I know where this is going and it's so stupid it makes you truly understand just how monumentally dumb the flat earthers are. Little kids can figure this out and those dumbasses can't even beat me in a fight. That makes me smarter than them, right? We all know that in the daytime it is 90 degrees in the sunlight 80 degrees in the shade, depending on the conditions. I know I'm, I'm not going to do the Celsius conversion up here, sorry. Laughs in English weather. Yeah, no. And it's that kind of, what? Other places exist? Type of attitude that makes people like you give Americans a bad name with the rest of the world. Still, absolutely flawless for a flirt, so I will allow it. Also, I'm just assuming he's American, because if it turns out he's Canadian, you guys need to get a hold of your boy and, I don't know, have Mounties polite him to death, eh? Uh, however, at night, especially when the moon is high in the sky, we see the opposite. While it might be 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's warmer at 60 degrees in the moon's shade. So, do you see it? Do, do you see the stupid? If you don't, I'm so terribly sorry. You have terminal stupidity. Here's your earth and flat hat and scarf. Go join your people. The rest of you, yeah? When the moon is high, or likely is in the middle of the night, and under the moon shade it's warmer, do you think they've tried this when the moon's not out, and it has basically the same effect? Because it's not the flipping moonlight, but the absence of the OG sunlight that's simply not directly heating us up as we face away from it. And that shade is just protecting what's under it from exposure. This is so astounding. Astoundingly dumb. I can't believe even this guy can't wrap his head around it and instead thinks it's a discovery of cold moonlight. Amazing. Sometimes showing temperature shifts of over 13 degrees Fahrenheit. In addition, under controlled experiment conditions, magnified moonlight is even colder still. Again, the opposite of sunlight. I would love to see these experiments, and more so would like to know if they have been replicated, and if they are actually even testing what you think they're testing. Somehow, 
I seriously doubt it. We can generate this with technology today using a cold laser. The question is, why is the moon giving off a cold laser light? I'm confused. What do you mean cold laser? I don't think there is such a thing, although I could be wrong. But do you mean like cold laser therapy? Because, well, that just means a laser that doesn't burn you. It's not hot, but not actually cold. Maybe he means laser cooling sick, although that's about cooling atoms. And heat, when we're talking about atoms, doesn't really mean what most people think it means. It's about stopping their vibrations with lasers. And it's generally used to create ultra cold atoms for experiments in quantum physics. Okay, well, that sounds like some fairly complex sciencey stuff, and I don't really understand it, so I am 100% sure it's not something this guy understands either, because, well, he thinks moonlight is cold, so who the hell knows what he's actually talking about? They had no answer. Every single time you say that, your entire story becomes so much harder to believe. It's like me talking about being handsome, famous and good at the sex. I mean, something unbelievable. <laughs> Not those hashtag true facts. <laughs> but no, I don't believe for a single moment that an actual smart science guy from a universe of bubbles couldn't or wouldn't have an answer for these unless some part of your little yarn about the setup is just an out and out fabrication. And after listening to your questions, I don't believe that lie is yours, because lying takes creativity and some intelligence, and you clearly lack either. Last but not least. <sighs> I'm sure this will be good. And by good, I mean, please kill me. The Van Allen belts. A simple yes or no question. Are the Van Allen radiation belts deadly? No. I mean, yes. I mean, I don't know. What the f*** is a Van de Demdi boy belt? If yes then how did Apollo 11 through 17 make round trips through these belts with only aluminum and plastic as shielding? Hey, you said it was a yes or no question. Maybe he is smart enough to lie. Plot twist. No one died, no one got radiation poisoning, nobody even got cancer. I think there's still like five left. I don't know why, but that sounds like a challenge. I mean, I can try to give cancer, I guess, but what do I get out of it? I guess the ability to give people cancer. But that's only useful if there's people who hate me and everybody loves me. But only since I got the ability to give people cancer with my mind. Radiation is only stopped by two metals, lead and gold. Both are very heavy and cannot be used in aerospace because of their weight. Okay, assuming that's true, and obviously I'm not a nuclearization techno blokey, but hazmat suits can have linings to protect against radiation and they have to be light enough to wear so i don't know and again i stress i am not a nuclear technomation but i did look into the radiation of the van ellen belt and how much radiation they experience going through them it's approximately 13 rads for the hour that it takes to go through the belts and that's hitting the outside of the shuttle and inside according to nasa it's shielded, so basically it becomes negligible. All in all, it's a big no, so long as you are travelling through them at a reasonable speed. I imagine staying in them might be more of a problem though. If the answer is no, the belts are not deadly, then explain the video currently on the NASA.gov website called Orion Trial by Fire, in which NASA clearly states the belts are so dangerous they will not be testing manned capsules because they are unable to solve the radiation problem. Well, that's a f***ing lie. Or again, you're just so dumb that you heard the words. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice. Once up, and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. I didn't understand them because words are so hard. And yes, I did clip a bit of that out. It was just music. I don't know about you though. None of that suggested that they can't send people, but instead that they are sending unmanned craft first to collect data so they can make sure any people sent are as well protected as possible. It's like you think that testing things is some kind of weakness of science and not the thing that basically makes it work. They test it, 
make a thing that works, then use that thing with people. And remember, the space program has given us bundles of innovations. Remind me again of all the scientific breakthroughs and inventions that have come from the flat earth guys. And I mean the ones that are correct. So your cold moon garbage doesn't count. Keep in mind, this is not an old video. It was created at the end of 2014. And yet you think you might have watched it by now. Also, that it could very well mean that they have solved the issue, making your point ever more redundant. The scientist viewed my recording and folded like a card table. This piece was never aired. Yes, a brain hemorrhage can cause a person to collapse rather dramatically. Anyway, how do you know? I thought there was no response. And again, I still cannot fathom that anyone even slightly smarter than my dumb ass couldn't absolutely demolish your points more effectively than I already have. And not to be that guy, but come on, you got riggedy wrecked, son! All that being said, my name is Mark Kendall Sargent, and I'm a flat earther. This video couldn't have made that any clearer. I have never heard such a poor set of arguments collated into such a small amount of space. Well done, I guess. <laughs> Clearly surrounded by more flat earthers, and by flat earthers I mean morons. <sighs> well, at least it's over, yeah? Flat Earth is my passion, it is my obsession, and it is now my life. I watched my very first Flat Earth video in the summer of 2014. It's not even finished! Oh, no, I'm done. That's the last time I go digging through other people's garbage for content. For at least a day. Hey up, chaps and chapettes. For those of you who came from Kat's video, I would like to say welcome to my channel. I'm sorry that my video was so bad. My usual content isn't any better. For those of you who haven't watched his video yet, go do it now. It's better than mine, and bloody subscribe while you're at it. He's almost as handsome and famous and as good at the sex as I am. And for those of you not watching either channel's videos, nothing. You're not even here. Why would I even bother talking to you? That would be stupid. Almost as stupid as Mark and Nathan. And finally, yes, the made up stories we each have for doing the videos are completely different. Well done for catching that. It's called having no idea what I'm doing. Why haven't you subscribed to Conspiracy Cats yet?